Good morning, and welcome to Denver Public Library's Saturday Matinee. I'm your host, Daria, and I'm joined by Andrew in supporting today's discussion of Steve DeJarnett's iconic film, Miracle Mile. As always, use the chat for all of your awesome comments and questions, and we'll look at those in the 15 to 20 minutes to the end. As far as that discussion goes, keep in mind we are here to talk about this film and the related works, and maybe Walter's book. So keep your questions focused on that and be excellent to each other. December 12th talk with Peter Ramsey on Let the Right One In has been uploaded to Denver Library's YouTube channel and the recommended film and book list had been sent out. Therefore, the titles mentioned today will be sent out after this event concludes, so you don't have to take notes. If you are having trouble with the sound or the picture, message Andrew or myself, we'll do our very best to help you out. And now, in the chat and through your cam, give the warmest welcome to our very special panel today, film critic Walter Chow and writer-director Steve DeJarnett. Hey, good morning, everybody. Oh, Steve's got the opening clap. This is the real clapboard from the film. There we go. Hey, all right. So usually this is the space where I give a long introduction or, you know, longer than you probably want to hear from me uh, about it. I'll give sort of a shorter version of it today. The year 1987, 88, 89, those were the matinee years of my movie going experience. I think we all have those, the special films that are um, dear to us, that affected us in a way that you know, maybe films never will again or have again. It's where you fall in love with movies. I think for me, it started in 1985, likely. Um, Steve's holding up my book. Let's not, we don't have to talk about that book. Um, thank you. Uh, the, uh, in 1985, with Back to the Future, I sat in the theater and I saw it twice back to back. We lied to the usher about why we were there. And, uh, uh, and it goes all the way through. 1987 in particular was a keystone year for me as I was growing up. I was uh, how old was I? 15 years old. That 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 year, um, we watched. Uh, I watched The Princess Bride, Dirty Dancing, Lethal Weapon, Full Metal Jacket, Adventures in Babysitting, The Untouchables, Predator, Lost Boys, RoboCop, Fatal Attraction, Angel Heart, one of my all-time favorite movies, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Moonstruck, 1987, Raising Arizona, Hellraiser, uh, 88. Um, in 1989, it was a rough year. I was 16 years old in high school then. I was very depressed. Uh, lots of issues be un underlying that, behind that. And I tried to kill myself. I didn't succeed, obviously. Um, but uh, after I got out from the hospital, I went to our local uh, rental. It was just down the street from us in 20th and Youngfield in Applewood. And I rented a couple of movies. Uh, I rented Near Dark and I rented Miracle Mile. And over the course of that summer, as I sort of self-healed from, uh, from that, I watched Miracle Mile, I think, every day uh, dur during that. And, you know, I hadn't thought about why or, or you know it was soothing to me for some reason watching this apocalyptic love story um 30 some years later uh eight years ago lots of years flying around which is dangerous for me because i'm not good at that i can't even remember my kids birthdays i love them i just not good at dates anyway i uh, uh about eight, eight years ago nine years ago i picked up the phone at, and i called steve DeJarnet. i had found his uh i found him through facebook the the uh, great scourge of our society also good for a couple of things now and then i called steve and um steve answered and he got real suspicious at first he was like why are you calling me why do you want to talk about this movie uh who cares about this and i said well i care about this and i wanted to figure out why i cared about it and i so i wrote a book about it and i wrote about that summer and my suicide attempt and and why the film perhaps scene by scene uh, kind of led me back from a dark place. So in many ways, more than, you know, just the romantic, it saved my life, Miracle Mile did. Um, I wrote the book. Uh, it got little to no attention, unfortunately. It has now. It's starting to get some major attention for some reason. But um, it did lead, I think, ultimately to Steve getting the offer finally for Miracle Mile to get a high definition restoration on home video. Uh, on Blu-ray through Kino Lorber. So that's what happened. Steve flew me out there so that I could do the commentary track with him. And I realized that every step along this journey that very few people get a second chance in life, very much less a chance to close a circle 
uh, and this for me was the closing of that circle. So the, the, the film has been very dear to me uh, in my life and, and, and Steve has become very dear to me in the last few years. Uh, without further, much further ado, I should say that this film was at Sundance, uh, the same year that True Love won, won in the best drama uh, competition, Nancy Savoka's True Love, which is really a fantastic film. Nancy will be a guest of ours in 2021. Um, she won for True Love, but that was also the year that Heather's was at Sundance, uh, another wonderful, wonderful film from that period of my life, and uh, a Sex, Lies, and Videotape, which began to change everything around that period, um, and Miracle Mile was there, and, 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 and the key, I think, film from that Sundance, it was right before Sundance became, for lack of a better word, sort of commercial. Uh, it was where we had truly independent, truly daring movies coming out of Sundance, um, so this is an anniversary of sorts, right? Because Sundance is right around the corner. Anyway, uh, it, it, it came out on home, home Video 1989, obviously. It was released in May of that year. I think it was hurt a little bit by the fall of the Ber Berlin Wall at the end of 1989, ironically. We can talk a little bit more about that. But um, upon meeting Steve and talking with Steve, we, uh, you know, I, I found a guy who was ex exceedingly humble about what he'd done, exceedingly humble about his accomplishments, uh, a, a, a guy of, of, of surpassing warmth. You know, I don't get starstruck very often, but when I first met Steve, it felt like, you know, he, this was a person who was, I had known for all my life, even though he'd only known me for a few minutes. So I put him at a disadvantage, I think. Anyway, uh, without further ado, Steve DeJarnett. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm amazed that we, we sold this out or we got so many people for this film, but I credit that to Walter. Well, you, you, you're, you're constantly amazed, but there's, there's constantly, uh, you know, an, an, an interest in your film. And I guess we could start there. Why do you think your film, at, you know, all these years down the road is so, for obvious reasons, I guess, but why do you think it's still so relevant? Well, it's very relevant for just a few more days since, there, <laughs> <laughs> since we have somebody who can start it, you know, uh, if the my pillow guy asks him to. Um, so, and it's the last four years, it's been, you know, it's maybe plausible. I always like to tell people the movie's much more likely to happen now, even without the administration than back then when everything was on hyper alert because missiles are still pointed and nobody's really, you know, it's not a fine tuned system, you know, there's a, there with the bombers in the air and all that. It's like somebody could screw it up. Um, so we're lucky that things have got blown off the face of the earth yet, but um, I still think that will happen at some point. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's something that's been very sobering for me in the last four years is how there aren't really any check, you know, guards or, or fail safes that I always thought there was these things that were in place so that accidents couldn't happen. Um, but apparently there does, there, ha there isn't, and there doesn't seem to be very they, much accountability. They, they used to be, they used, like I said, it used to be a fine tuned system but that, there was like 36 documented accidents of, of it nearly starting or dropping an H-bomb outside of Charlotte, I think, that all, you know had three interlocking keys that had to be turned to activate. Two of them went off when it landed. So you know, there were a lot of very close calls. So you wrote this originally in 1978, 79. You, you turned it into Warner Brothers. So it's really very much a product, this film is, of the paranoid 1970s. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your, you know, it's based on a dream, right? Well, I, I mean, not wondering, I used to have re reoccurring dreams, you know, as I think anybody who grew up, you know, in our, you know, late boomer uh, generation, because we were trained in school, just the way they are, sadly, for shootings. Now we were trained to get under the desk, duck, roll and cover, um, you know, to take our cans of food if you have some mammoth chunks uh, down in your uh, thing. Actually, I got uh, survival biscuits from 1962 here too. And that you, you know, you're gonna dust the radio, you know, brush the radioactive dust off and go fight the commies. That, that was indoctrinated into you. So obviously, you know, when you're a kid, uh, your, your id goes crazy at night and I would have dreams of the missiles coming. So it was, the film was really a way to exercise uh, my demons and my dreams and give them to other people. So yeah. I, haven't had, I haven't had a bad nuke dream since I made the film. So. The, 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 you know, for, for a long time, the script was the, one of the most sought after and, and, and celebrated scripts in Hollywood. Uh, you had the first option on it, I know, and at some point you were offered 
four hundred grand on it, but you you uh, you declined because you wanted to direct it yourself. Can you talk a little bit about that process of bringing it to the yeah, screen? Yeah, I, I pitched it. I made a you know I was a busboy in Highland Park, the hipster neighborhood in L.A. when there was no hipsters there, and I I took me two and a half years and I made a film noir short um, Tarzan, thirty five millimeter. Had Eddie Constantine in it, Tim Carey, Edie Adams, a bunch of people. And that played Filmex, um, which was the equivalent of Sundance in 78. The short played in 78. And I went, it was like the big picture, another movie that played that year at Sundance. Uh, went from being a busboy to a Hollywood director overnight, literally. The next week, 10 agents wanted to sign me. I pitched ideas to Tony Bill, who had taken Marty Brest and Amy Heckerling and other AFI people um, into Warner Brothers. My film was not an AFI film. I dropped out and made it anyway. Um, four shoots, three different DPs. But it, you know, it was enough of a showcase that all people offered me features to direct. I pitched it to with Tony to Mark Rosenberg, who was the head of Warner Brothers production. Uh, his brother, Alan, plays the street sweeper, the young street sweeper in the movie. And he's sort of playing Mark. Mark was in the SDS. And, and they liked the idea. And I turned the script in in December 79. They loved it. But they wanted, they wanted something for, you know, probably the ending. But, and they kept wanting to put big riders on it. And, you know, the development costs would get enormous. So I asked for it back. They gave it back for free for a year. Then I optioned it for two years and then I had to either buy it outright or other people were going to buy it. And I gave, I was set to, I have a writing credit on Strange Brew and for five minutes I was the director, but I had a contract. So they paid me 50 grand to not direct Strange Brew, <laughs> gave every penny to Warner Brothers and owned my movie. Then, the, then Mark Rosenberg, I guess, wanted to do it as Twilight Zone, the movie. I didn't know this at the time, you know, only later and offered my agent, Jim Burkus, you know, a big guy, 400 grand to, for me to sell it back to not direct. And I turned it down and spent eight years starving and getting it made. So. You, you're, you know, when, when you're writing it, there is interesting because you wrote it for an older actor. You, you wrote it for like Gene Hackman, right? Or, or yeah, this is the original yeah. Paul Chadwick uh, <laughs> uh, sketch that was in there. Um, yeah, and there's an older guy going back to get his ex and, you know, there's always talk of rebooting it, you know, somehow I, I hope they would do that version if they do it. So it's the, the reconciliation story of the grandparents is the main story. You're still a trombone player in town briefly and he hasn't seen his ex and his kid in 15 years. So, you, you know, you have, a, you know, it's not two people meeting who barely know each other, which is, you know, I love that. That's my movie. But it's another version. And it does have a lot of power to it because you have to reconcile your life and things like that while on the run and time the clock. Yeah. You know, I, I think I speculated. I can't remember what you said. I think you probably debunked it, but that you named Harry's character after Harry Call in the conversation. Is that no. just, is that just <laughs> me? That's you? That's not me. I, I, I love lore that springs up about their <laughs> Uh, but but there was somebody who did a thing saying that it's, it's and, and please everybody start this lore that that it was based on this novel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so somebody just did a review based on the Walter Brown novel. Yeah. No, that's that would be a very different film, I'm afraid. Um, we, when you first started doing it, Kurt Russell was attached to it, and then you you got Nicolas Cage talking about it. Yeah, I mean, it went through, I mean, the older incarnation, you know, it was incarnation. Um, Paul Newman was who everybody wanted. And I think Ted Field once, you know, paid me something to just do a rewrite for him as Racing Buddy. And if he wanted to do it, um, th then they would make a big budget movie. And if not, he was going to give me $2 million to make it anyway. He, he, he reneged on the deal. But, um, <laughs> you know, Gene Hackman, var various things like that. And then I wrote, you know, the two people meet and fall in love. Um, Kurt Russell, I had two three hour meetings with him at Ivy at the shore. And at the end of each meal, he was going to do the movie. I think we offered him half mil. And, but he was still pretty, 
you know, going with an indie, you know, new director or, you know, still trying to be, a, you know, a big time movie star um, would be very different. Nick Cage was attached on a $2 million budget. Um, and, you know, this is right after Valley Girl. He had a lot of charisma and that uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad it worked out the way it worked out. I mean, it's, I can't imagine it any other way now. I think that would have been weirdness on top of weirdness and it would have a cult, <laughs> but a smaller cult. Yeah. You, um, you know, I, I, I think we can share that uh, Anthony Edwards and Mary Winningham are, are a couple now after all the years they've had separate relationships and everything and they've separated and whatever, but they're back together now. They're, they're they, they are diamonds. Uh, they live in New York. Just a look. Um, and, uh, you know, they're happy and I couldn't be, I mean, that's the reason for making the movie to, to have those two beautiful people. So uh, what a lot of people don't really re re remember about the eighties, if they didn't live through it was how, how terrifying a time it was. Whenever we see these reboots of the 1980s and stuff, it's always the, you know, the jazzer size and everything. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the apocalyptic sense that you captured about the eighties. I do have some jazz right in there too. But, you know. Oh, so there's jazzer size. That's true. Yeah. There's some great outfits in there, but um, you, you know, t talk to me about the, the, the doom in your movie and where that comes from, from you. Well, to me, it's like, you know, we're all, you know, we were all born, we all are looking for loves somehow, and we're all gonna die. So it's just, you know, can you find that person before you die? I guess is the, is the short thing. And it's a chicken little story also, I think. So, you know, you know, if you, if you knew this much, how, how far would you go in following that rumor? You know, we, we follow rumors much easier today. So that's, it would be a tricky thing to do today in the, yeah, I, I, I was going to say the movie is prescient in so many ways, but, you know, especially in the role of media and the role of rumor um, and, and misinformation and how quickly that spreads, you know, even among now the left. And I'm not saying there wasn't a conspiracy at the Capitol. I feel like there is. But, you know, I have to be careful because conspiracy theories are the same thing that we condemn the other side for and has gotten us to this place. It's so attractive. Well, in the Boston, Boston Marathon thing, it was like they... People were like pegging people as suspects, you know, who weren't and didn't. So you got to let the law enforcement and the process bring you the truth. We don't have Walter Cronkite anymore to go on TV and tell us what we need to know and nothing else. Walter Cronkite was in the original script. Um, yeah, if you know, if I remember, you have him swearing on the air and walking off the set. Is that right? Yeah, he swears and breaks down and says, fuck it, you know. Um, and we actually got to him. He had just retired. He was on his boat. Um, he, so he was almost in it. <laughs> or, you know, I think his kids, somebody wanted him to do it. But, you know, I wasn't a famous guy. I think if I was a big director, he might have. Same thing with Carl Sagan, the whole opening was sort of written. He was taken from Cosmos, that animation, uh, which was perfect. And, you know, the billions and all that. Uh, but he chickened out. He didn't want to you know, tarnish his... Sorry, cred. <laughs> so you, you know, you talk about that little video. The 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 video, the vibe reel that we opened today with is a something that you edited together. But it's scored by 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 Paul Hazlinger of Tangerine Dream, and he kind of re-timed it just so that it would fit the the reel. Can you talk a little bit about your collaboration with Tangerine Dream? Which you know, I love Tangerine Dream. They they had they you know they seem to score all of my favorite movies. Can you talk about how that came about and the process of it for this film? I, I wrote the script in the middle of the night to tan to Sorcerer soundtrack, the first soundtrack, which is you know the best soundtrack ever, I think, uh, for me. Um, and Frank Sinatra, you know, um, albums a little bit. Um, and so you know, you do the rough cut, and we were a low budget movie, so. And Hemdale, who financed it, uh, was pretty cheap. So you, in the rough cut, you put in, you know, any cue you want. So it was 90% Tangerine Dream and 10% Peter Gabriel Birdie soundtrack and some other, like, pad stuff. And, you know, we sent it to them, and they wanted to do it. And John Daly, God bless him, the head of Hemdale, stepped up, and, and I got to go to Vienna for a week and work with him and, Everything was just completely, the sound, music editor didn't have to do anything. It was like completely cued. 
Right? Yeah, it, 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 it's an un- unusual score for them because they, they 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 generally tended to just give drop needle tracks, but for this one, they they scored it to the film. You know, a lot of times that they. they you know, they just send the movie into the director or the studio who took the film away from the director and it, you know, they put it in the wrong order that Tangerine Dream won. And Tangerine Dream at this time was just Edgar. Um, and, you know, to me, Tangerine Dream was always Edgar, of course. And then Paul, who was just fresh out of a, like sort of classical trained um, music academy. And it was just those two. And I think that's why it was different too, because it's uh, Paul's classical training. He he's doing all kinds of big scores now, but um, and you know, it was a thrill of my life to actually get them to be able to do that. So, so so really extraordinary collaborators that you had. You 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 mentioned Paul Chadwick. You've got some of the art, the uh, that that Paul Chadwick did. He's a great you know comic book artist and writer as as well. Yeah, he does country. I mean, I think and he storyboarded it too. But you know. Okay. So these are nine paintings that went in the script, uh, you know, in the scene where they were, you know, in the 10 years before making it. So people could visualize what, you know, the, the film was going to look like. And they're, you know, some of them are very close. Uh, the pump don't work because the van was took to handle. I'm going to go in here. Okay. <laughs> Oops, that's that's not a Chadwick. Um, and you know, storyboarded it twice. I think the original concept it was going to be like, um, you know, rope or Birdman or whatever, one shot where you're hidden wipes. And I'm glad I didn't do that. You you never leave Harry. He's never not in the scene. You might he might go into the background on the truck or something. You talk to a couple other characters, but. You never cut away from him once the real time stuff comes up and never to the other end of the phone call. So that's the concept that we are Harry Washello, but that restrictive thing of trying to simulate one shot. It's a great exercise. I've done some long winners, but for a whole movie, I, I think that's, you know, a fool's game, but I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. You, there's so much fluidity in, in, in the editing of it, you know, in the opening credits, I don't think, credit properly the the uh, the editor there 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 there's two names do you want to talk well, about you know steve semmel's a big editor and 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 director now i mean he's a very talented guy he shot my, one of my shorts uh but he got injured or something and wasn't there for like the last year and kathy weaver who did a lot of uncredited editing i think on raising arizona and stuff really you know it was her and me in the room for a year and me going out and shooting second unit stuff. I just, there's, I got to break this down. So there's 10 minutes of the movie I shot after the movie with small crews, you know, you know, you know, just, to, I had to stay on schedule. If I got two days behind, we were, we were, it was such a tough shoot. I'd be fired. So I just, you let things go and you come back and, you know, you get these little pieces and I'll illustrate that sometime. All this stuff's going to be up on the website too. I, I hope uh, there's a link for that. Just put in stevedejarnet.net and I've got about 5% up there, but there's all kinds of stuff. The supporting cast, you know, outtakes, tons of stuff. There will be massive Miracle Mile stuff on there at some point. So Miracle Mile is obviously not the only movie that you've done. You also did Cherry 2000, um, which is has a really a lot of fascinating ideas. As I was watching some of Westworld, the uh, new the newer HBO series, I saw a lot of those ideas that, that you talk about in Cherry 2000 coming through, uh, even today in those conversations about sex workers and sex bots in, in particular. Yeah, attorneys negotiating one night stands because <laughs> men and women can't communicate. Um, yeah, the, you know, that you have to credit to Lloyd Fonville, who did the story, and Michael Almereda, uh, who wrote the script, and Connie Chubb. Because I came on, I jumped on that. That was, a director fell out, and there was a moving train, you know, already getting ready for production. And in retrospect, I, you know, that was not how I've ever made a movie, or probably should. And, um, you know, now I love that people, you know, dig it. Um, but it was a really tough shoot and it's, just, it's a weird movie, but it has a lot of charm and, uh, I credit Basil 
Palladoris and uh, who scored it, uh, the supporting cast, and Julie Weiss, the costume designer. So there's just a lot of creative people doing that, and I helped. I was the director, but uh, <laughs> um, it's not it's it's not a film by me. I, even even the Miracle Mile, I refuse the a film by credit, even though I wrote it, directed it, essentially produced it. There, there's really no producers, I, but it's a film by these guys. If you can see, that's the crew. That's awesome. Oh. So yeah. you go from a feat, from a feature film career, and you, you started working a lot in television. Uh, one of the assignments you you were reunited with Anthony Edwards on ER on, on several episodes of ER. What was that like? What was the oh. first day back? E ER is the great, you know, it was the greatest show to go direct. I mean, that crew was so amazing. I mean, I really prepped. I went in there with stand-ins and did, you know, rehearsed all my study camp things, but they can do anything in, in two minutes. You have this, you know, those one they, they just make it work. I went on to some other, you know, crappy medical shows at Lifetime <laughs> and the crew couldn't do that. They said, yeah, it's impossible. Well, they do it in their sleep on the ER. So, um, and yeah, it was wonderful to, to do that. I did another one with Alan Alda, it was great. So now you've become an author you uh, a, a celebrated published author um, of short stories. Uh, Grace for Grace is, is your is your collection. Do you have a copy of it? Hold up. There's a link to it in the thing. Yeah, and there I will say there's uh, from tomorrow, Sunday, for one week, you go to the University of Chicago Press, you know, who is distributing it, website. There's a 25% discount. You know, stories were in the best American short stories and New England Review and other things. I think if you like Miracle Mile or Cherry, you'll definitely dig these stories. There's an ebook version, starts at 10 bucks. So it's, you know, 750 for the discount. That's 60 cents a story, I think. <laughs> Check there's, it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there, there's a story there in particular that I love about, you know, a, a woman trapped in this in, in her, her roof as her house is flooding. Which really has strong Miracle Mile vibes. It's a guy, but yeah. oh god, it has really strong vibes though of a uh, of Miracle Mile. Yeah, that's sort of the most well-known story. That was Rubio Rising. That's the one that was in the best American short stories and the shortest. Um, and yeah, I, you know, people nearly drowning, or you know, I guess that's a theme I have going. Um, but that that story is worth you know spending seven fifty on. I think there, there's some other. <laughs> There's a story, Her Great Blue, about a very surreal thing about a, an ex model, a whale, and a tsunami that I think you'll get your money's worth to. You know, we, we should talk a little bit about the other endings that, that you were asked to produce for this film. And, and the, there was one too with a couple of animated diamonds that you can find on the uh, Blu ray now. But what were some of the things that you re, 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 rejected for, uh, uh, for uh, an ending? I, I never really had. Um, I mean, the, the diamond thing was my idea, and we, you know, we shot it. It's on, it's on the Blu-rays. Um, Elisa Bello, a friend of mine, the the Go Go's original drummer, you know, did. I, I don't know if you can. See, I can't see where, where these are, but you know, these diamonds spinning away. So it's two seconds long. The happy ending, white light coalesces into two spinning diamonds, and. John Daly, God bless him, the head of Hemdale, ran for him. I was on the fence, even though I commissioned it. Uh, and he said, yeah, that's too upbeat. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's cut it. Let's, let's rip their hearts out. That's the studio head. You know, you get studio heads saying, let's go darker. Unless your studio head's Leonard Cohen. Something that no one was able to see before it was released on Blu-ray was at the very end of the credits, after the credits, there's a, a a sound cue um, that 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 was in the theatrical prints, but had been you know lopped off for the the, the really inadequate uh, DVD release. Do you want to talk a little bit about what the cue was? There's an air raid siren. So as the lights come up and you're walking out of the theater, a you know an air raid siren comes on and and freaks you out. <laughs> I remember for promo when the film was released, we were going to try to activate all the air raid sirens in Los Angeles. <laughs> I'd probably just be getting out of jail now, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, just as a stunt. They're still there. You can see them around. There's one near Johnny's, I think. 
and, and you know, before we, we we open it up for questions, I do want to talk a little bit about that um, location, Johnny's. Uh, it, it, it's one of the original Googie diners. There, there's a great collection of of pictures and stories called Googie uh, yeah. '50s Coffee Shop Architecture by Alan Hess. It's really great. Yeah. It talks about the style of of, of 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 coffee shop during the '50s and '60s, and the the original Googies was on 8100 Sunset. It's right right next to Schwab's. Um, and you know, it sort of inspired all of this. Uh, John Lautner, the LA's greatest. Exactly, yeah, Lautner's. Uh, yeah. Um, so, talk a little bit about Johnny's, what it is now, and 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 shooting there, and your thoughts about shooting there. It's it's still there, although it's been Bernie's. I don't know if it's still Bernie's. They they turned it over for Bernie's campaign, which is great with me. But like, I think they desecrated some of it. I hope they restored it. Um, it was still an active restaurant when we shot. We art directed it. This is something on the we we do a commentary together uh, on uh, on the Kino and the others too. But um, there's uh, uh, Chris Horner, the production designer, and Teo and I, um, the, Teo Vandesanti, the DP, watching the movie again. We first of all we couldn't believe we made the film for the budget we did. Uh, but Johnny's, you know, Chris is pointing out we art directed it used to, it didn't used to have that blue in there and all the stuff so the way that it looks now is how we we made it look and it's been a set ever since uh even the bulbs they weren't working so teo said on that commentary uh, he had the gaffer dip five thousand bulbs three times in blue paint for the, to get the color temperature right and they're still working mm-hmm. but those bulbs weren't working when we shot so um, right. And we got the supporting cast in there uh, for what, four or five years ago, whenever the, for the Kino. Almost everybody who's still with us um, in there, and it's, a, it's an extra on the Kino. There's 25 minutes more on the European ones. It hits, it, there's, you know, it's, there's a German and French and UK. So it's come out in all these different countries. Hoping still someday for a super deluxe one that has everything, has Tarzan and everything on it. You know, fingers crossed, we'll see. Um, in a couple of years, there's no hurry. Uh, and you'll, Walter, you'll have to, you know, help present that, I think, if we do it. So, well, it, 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 it might sell better if you promise that I won't. But the uh, supporting cast is really remarkable for this film. John John Agar, Robert DeQui, Olan Jones, who I adore, D- Diane Delano, um, Eddie Bunker, for yeah. God's sake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Danny De La Paz, Kurt, you know, Kurt Fuller, Brian Thompson. I mean, really, it's 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 amazing that we had all those people. And they're, so, and they're great people. We had a big love fest, you know, when we got together at Johnny's again. So, so, so someone who didn't make the final cut, which has always fascinated me, is, is, is Joe Turkle. The guy who plays, you know, Tyrell and Blade Runner and, and the bartender and the shining. Um and Path uh, Paz the Glory. And yeah. Paz, yes, indeed. And and you know, I I I met Joe Joe Turkle a few years ago and I asked him about his experience shooting Miracle Mile. I'm always asking this question. He's like, What movie? I don't recall anything about anything called that movie. So he originally was going to be in the elevator right at the end of the film. We we, we shot it. I the, on on the website, there's the, the scenes in there. Um this is a danger of hiring people that you like on screen from something many years ago and you don't really, I don't know if we auditioned. Yeah, we did audition. But when he showed up, and he's a wonderful guy, but he thought he was playing the Gersted role, I think. So <laughs> he had to kind of scramble. And then this was a great lesson for me as a young filmmaker at the time and for any young filmmaker. You know, I don't, I, you know, I try to be nice to everybody, have it be a big love fest. But there's times when you've got to be a hard ass. And I was shooting a, this scene that I, when I was shooting it, I knew it was never going to be in the movie. It just didn't work. It wasn't properly written. It was a, when they get, when Tony and Mayor, Harry and Julie get together in the elevator again, before they go up, they went down. And then Joe Turkel and a woman step onto that. And then they're quoting the levels of Dante's Inferno, you know, the, the, uh, you know, and it's it was a writerly thing, and then you open up, and there's more terrible carnage going on in the basement, and then they go up to the heliport, and it just wasn't working. He was struggling with things because that wasn't the party prepared for, 
And I was indulging him. He went on another take, et cetera. And then Tony and Mayor, the best people in the world, are over here getting antsy because their big emotional scene is, you know, we're cutting into the time to film that. So I had to pull the plug, you know, and I should have pulled it earlier. People were whispering in my ear, Steve, you know. So this is the thing, when you're concentrating on what's in front of you as a director, you got to remember what you're doing next. Um, but I know that pretty well now from doing, you know, tel tons of television. But younger, you know, novice directors can lose sight of that. So, all right. So let's uh, let, let's answer some questions. Daria, who do we got from uh, our wonderful assemblage today? Uh, here's one from Ryan that I thought was really interesting. And Steve, let us know if you've got one of these before. <laughs> Uh, when all hell is breaking loose on the streets, how long did those scenes take to film and were there any injuries? Uh, yeah, well, the injury, you know, this is how stuntmen are. Gary Jensen, they're a great stuntman. Not in those chaotic scenes, but crashing the car into uh, Orbax, you know, the department store, he broke his back and didn't tell anybody about it. That's, you know, how stuntmen <laughs> uh, And then um, I'm sure somebody got banged up. There's some crazy stuff going on there. It was two nights, or maybe even a night and a half, blocking off Wilshire completely for a block and creating, you know, dawn at night. So we had Musco stadium lights over the whole block and trains and, you know, we were prepared, but it was, it was tough. Um, I, I do like to credit, uh, you know, uh, Christy Frankenheimer, the location manager who, you know, saved our ass so many times because we don't be up against the midnight deadline or whatever on other locations and she would, you know, uh, save our ass somehow, be able to keep shooting. So the, so, the long shot that you have of all the cars stretching off in Cherney, that's a, that's a matte painting. That's a yeah. matte painting and not a good one. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I cringe at that just in some of the helicopter shots uh, too, because you know, we had a model and um, you know, I think our entire effects budget was 25,000. We, we had an H bomb, there's an H bomb back there. Um, and we took it out. It's on, it's on the outtakes reel on, on, uh, the website uh, and on the key, on the various DVDs, uh, and a few other shots, but, um, yeah, it's, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have any money for things like that. Well, I, I love the little detail that you add of the guy who's pinned underneath the car, who's holding a clutching a copy of Variety in his That's, hand. You know, uh, uh, I must say, those kind of, it, there's, this throws me off sometimes when I'm watching it in the theater, because that, that would get a laugh. You know, I should have let the laughs go stop by then. But and people laugh a lot at this movie, which is great, you know, but in, in Paris at the, the you know, the cinema tech. Sitting next to somebody, he was laughing his head off when, when, uh, you know, uh, Wilson's sister's dying in in the department store. So I could like leave the theater. So it's like it's funny, but yeah, you're supposed to stop laughing, you know, towards the end. Um, but that that's that's a bit. That's to me, that's like a Joe Dante, uh, <laughs> you know, little little bit. Who I think he's he's a director I really admire, and you, where you just put a lot of stuff in there you know, in the background. Indeed. Homages. All right, Daria, what else do we got? question from Martin was this. Uh, the shift from romantic comedy to thriller was unexpected. The light tone of the movie led me to believe that there might be some drama, uh, sorry, <laughs> there might be some dream logic happening. But then the worst imaginable thing does happen. Can you talk about managing that tone shift? You know, a lot of people talk about how they can't pinpoint the genre of this movie. So how do you manage the tone? That was intentional and it, and it is tricky. I mean, I, the whole thing was to, it, you're watching, you know, I, before an audience, I usually say, you know, this is a uh, 80s, you know, fluffy 80s John Hughes romantic comedy that gets less fluffy as it goes along. And, you know, I know people today try to get their friends to watch it without knowing anything about it. So you're watching this, you know, movie with a bad mullet and some sappy stuff and, and then, and then that phone call has to sell it. And then you go into this other movie and you don't, you're not sure the terrain, you don't know what's right, what's true and what's not. And by the end, you can't believe where it went because Hollywood movies don't do that, but this one does. 
Uh, that's all intentional. That's that's part of it. Um, there is a dreamlike quality to it. So if you want the out of he's still sleeping back there, I guess you can have that. And there's there are some weird things with the opening shot with the trombone and the picture and you know how you could reinterpret the time a little bit. And that's just sort of put in there in the editing room to to confuse a little bit. But otherwise, it's supposed to play very real from there on. I was just going to say the first time that I saw it, the, the first few times, few, for a few hundred times I saw it, um, I think it was that fugue state that really was attractive to me because that kind of mirrored what I was feeling. You know, I was walking through the world in that way, sort of a fog, a haze, and and everything seemed a little bit night, nightmarish and doom laden. And I felt also romantic, like you were part of a romantic storyline when you're very depressed or, 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 or you're in a relationship, you know, it, 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 the first days anyway, you feel like you're part of a larger storyline. And I think that's what Miracle Mile does really remarkably well is it creates a world in which you are part of a larger storyline and you may not know all the threads of it. And some of it may seem surreal uh, and it is surreal. It, it, it doesn't seem right, but Los, that yeah, rightness Los, is true. Los Angeles at night is surreal. We did make this choice, you know, not to wet the streets down and use smoke and backlight and, you know, going for the Blade Runner look or the MTV video look, which is the cheap Blade Runner look. So it's a little less dated because of that, it, as far as an 80s movie. Um, but it also gives that sort of crystalline, you know, very clear um, thing of a dream. You know, well, it, you, you know, the, the, the way that you shot L.A. at night reminded me a lot of how Walter Hill shoots it in The Driver. The drive, the driver, the driver was absolutely a look that we ref, referenced in 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 it. So um, yeah, it it, it 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 it's almost like the way that Nicholas Rogue shoots Venice, right? I mean, it's a city that no one ever sees this way, and, and kind of all the more remarkable for it, you know. And other touchstones for this film for me are are movies like After Hours, the uh, the uh, Scorsese. Now, I, you know, wrote the script, you know, in 79, so it was long before that. I mean, I love After Hours. It's a good double bill, because you're running around empty streets, but uh, people go, were you influenced by After Hours? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it's also, both films kind of loop back. You introduce a character, and then you come back, and and, and do that type of thing. You know, and I think that, that that's part of the nightmarish quality of it, right? You can't ever escape the same people. They're, they're just the same people. They're always orbiting. Oh, um, other questions, Daria? Uh, folks are curious if there's anything, Steve, you use to research mass hysteria. Uh, let's see. The most appropriate book everybody should read. Can you see that? So Extraordinary Popular see. Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. This is a great book. I forget what year it's written, but you know, it's this is the tulip craze in Holland and burning witches when people get deranged. I don't know. Could be just a small inkling of some mass delusions going on now <laughs> um, that might be appropriate. But um, you, 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 you're inspired, Steve, though, by uh, Day of the Locust, right? The Nathaniel yeah. West. Day of the Locust, I would say, you know, for in Cornell Woolrich, maybe just sort of, you know, Cornell Woolrich stories are sort of, you know, something happens and your fate is kind of dealt to you and, and then it ends up, you know, something with the lions, I can't remember. But, um, and yeah, Day of the Locust, certainly the burning of Los Angeles is, was a big touchdown, so. Yeah. All right, other questions? Uh, well, speaking of that in the modern times, um, Ryan here is wondering how would Miracle Mile look if it was made today and talking about, you know, internet and fake news taken into account? You know, I, I'm hoping, you know, I may co-own the rights. I, I have some contracts that I have some attorney scribbles in there. Nobody can find the final contract. I do have to be hired as the first writer and the first director if somebody wants to do a reboot for film or television. And people have talked to me about it and I, I want somebody to do it because I, I want the payday and I would hope they would use that <laughs> script the, of the older Harry. But I can see it being a limited series, you know, from midnight to six in the morning. I would say, and this, I would just give them my two cents on a few things, have some solar flares going off in the month or two before. So your cell thing is intermittent and so it's down when the thing happens so people can't call and the internet's down. 
just that's the other thing with all that isn't a movie I want to make or see probably. Somebody wants to take it and do that and has a good way to do it. I'm all for it. Um, I'll have, you know, from a concept by me or something, but um, you know, I, I wouldn't want them to try to do you know, two people meet and fall in love. I think that's a difficult thing to do anyway. Um, because, and it takes a lot of time, maybe in a, in a mini series, but you know, various people have talked about it. I hope somebody good will want to do that. I, I know I'm going to talk to, uh, there's a, you know, Mark Von Arks, an attorney it has been helping. And um, there's a woman at the Writers Guild, an attorney who does negotiate with MGM somehow so I can get, you know, I'm not going to claim I'm a co-owner. I don't think I can ever prove that. But I'd like to find somebody who'd, who would go do that, particularly with all the streaming stuff. And you could still have it be today, you know, with whatever faction is doing it. You know, it certainly could be the, you know, would be more like, you know, Dr. Strangelove, where you got some military people, right wing military people who are gonna who are gonna do it. That's very plausible. So you you're you're so generous about your collaborators and, and everyone else who helped out. How much of this you know, the ancillary details and the little throwaway bits of dialogue, all those things, how much of those were improvised or was everything scripted? This is really pretty scripted. I'm trying to think, you know, on, on the outtakes, there's some other things. It, it, it was very scripted. I mean, I'm, I'm all for improv stuff. Like Gersted, that, you know, that was that rant was scripted. The phone call, certainly, which um, Tony did. I mean, if that phone call doesn't work, the movie doesn't work. Tony did an amazing job on that. Um, I remember that, yeah, the tone lurch, uh, Charlie Brooker, the, you know, the, um, when he was a critic said it had the biggest lurch of tone of any movie or something. <laughs> uh, I see a vat of dragon piss scripted. Yeah, that was scripted. <laughs> I'm just seeing things pop up. On it. <laughs> we, we have time for maybe one or two more. There was a question about the lighting in the elevator. Um, can you talk about that? Um, Watching it again last night, scene became super claustrophobic and even more down in the water. Oh, in the elevator or the yeah. helicopter? Uh, well, the elevator I, started it. Well, as I as I said, the, yeah, I mean, you you almost die, you know, several times in this. You know, there's I was you know, you're really frustrating the audience by those things. You know, you're together, then you separate, then you're together. And yeah, I told the Joe Turkel story where we're, we're wasting time filming that. And then, so when we got Tony and Mayer, we didn't do any other coverage other than this sort of moving in and the lights go out and rumbles and then move back and then move in again. And that works because of them, because it's, and I don't really, it's not a good idea to do emotional scenes in a profile. You really should be on a long lens over shoulder and look into somebody's soul and their eye. So we were prepared to do that. We didn't have time. So we just went with this thing where you're in there. So it, it works. Um, there is, was a thing in the script that we filmed a little bit of that would have also been frustrating. The first missile comes over and they're holding each other on the heliport and it lands about six blocks away and it doesn't go off. It's a dud. It's just smoking out there. And I researched that, you know, half of the Russian missiles would be duds, that they wouldn't work. So, but that was, that was too much. Plus we didn't have the effects budget to make it work. So in the outtakes, there is something with Gersted pointing to it and referencing it. So I have a question about the movie that's on the television when he wakes up three hours late. It's King Vidor's Bird of Paradise. And it's about, you know, spoiler alert about being thrown into a volcano. How, 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 how conscious are those ancillary details or, or, you know, the, the Cliff's Notes for Gravity's Rainbow, or uh, oh, the tarot yeah. card deck. All, all that's it. All that's for, 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 you know, is intentional. Uh, and Kathy Orison, my my good friend, film expert, I suggested for the Paradise. I think um, I'd actually put Tarzana, my black and white detective movie, on there late at night, but I colorized it. <laughs> I'm the only director <laughs> that colorized their own. Uh, uh, but yeah, this, you know, the gravity's rain. We had to get pensions permission. I just found in my, I'm going through hundreds of boxes of all this stuff. And I found a document where he had, to, he gave his permission for us to make clip notes of gravity's rain. Um, 
but um, you know, all that, all that's in there, I guess. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think the first time I asked you about that, you know, and I wanted to talk about Gravity's Rainbow, you said that you'd never read Gravity's Rainbow. I did. I read it a long time ago. <laughs> I'm such a slow reader. That's why I do short stories. I'm a really bad reader. Uh, I could never read it today. I'd have to use the cliff notes. Uh, but, uh, you know, but yeah, I, I love pitch. I mean, I did, you know, V is one of my favorites. I, I used to have a first edition of that. Um, and, you know, it has, you know, it, it relates so, so we're, we're almost out of time. I wanted to ask you about, you know, the, the, the social critique, I guess, in the film, just to go back to the media and the breaking through of glass and the breaking through of panes of glass to listen to the television and, you know, the live television reporters and everything, all of those things as I was watching it again this morning in preparation for today, I feel like I've been watching that for a whole week now with all the coverage of the riots, uh, you know, the taking of the Capitol building, it seems startlingly prescient with this idea of, you know, everybody has a means to broadcast these things. Can you talk about your thoughts about the media as it's evolved? Well, just on the chaos too, when the movie came out, people said that is so over the top, people wouldn't be out there, you know, looting. And then the, in 92, the, the, you know, the LA riots came and it looked just like, <laughs> so, you know, that is pretty accurate. Um, yeah. Media. I mean, that's what I said. You've, Without Walter Cronkite going on there and say, you know, two other, three other people, this is what you need to know. This is the truth. Nothing else is. But, um, you know, we everybody makes up reality for themselves. We're in a very dangerous time, not just bifurcated, but you know, people just don't need to adhere to a common reality. And I compare it to the Krell in Forbidden Planet. You know, an advanced civilization that taps into the id and creates an id monster that destroys them. That's what the what we're doing right now on the internet. We're destroying ourselves with our primal, tribal instincts. Um, and, you know, we better figure it out. All right. Well, Steve, this is our time. I wanted to thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for your film. Uh, you know, it's about time for you to reckon with its popularity and its lingering relevance for yeah. it. Go to the website, sign up, email things. There'll be a ton of stuff on there and the book. Um, and, you know, um, I thank you for supporting the film. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that it found its audience because of you, Walter. Ugh. And, and Joe Layden and Ron Garman and uh, Pat, a few people who, you know, years ago championed it. Well, it's one of the great films of my life. So thank you for that. Tails plates. <laughs>